I'm Victor Huang. My friend Phil Wickham and I are on the road, traveling the heartland to listen to local entrepreneurs who are starting and growing their businesses. We want to see communities in action and share the stories of people who are inspiring hope and renewing our economy. What are the stories that you'll tell from this trip when you get back to the foundation? I guess it's that radical realization that human beings are human beings and they have a desire to create and innovate no matter where they are. Like you kind of know it's true, but for some weird reason, every time you actually see it in person, it's like, oh wow, it's still true. These places, these cultures, they live and breathe the kind of values and the kind of activities that really feed startups well. You know, all they really have to do is, and they're already good at this, is just get out of their own way and make sure that they, they become the city that they are. If you had to reduce everything we do down to like one simple concept, it's get people out of their own way. Looking back on how economic development has been done historically or entrepreneurship education, it's like a top-down model where the folks that know tell the people what to do. But really, that's not entrepreneurship. And so the role of a foundation like Kaufman needs to be less around telling people how to, how to grow and more around putting water on the plants and letting those plants grow on their own. This is really the best path you know, short of the limited paths we've had for people who aren't in the mainstream to make their mark. Mr. Kaufman believed that education and entrepreneurship were the two keys to transform lives and to give people economic independence. Yeah. And it wasn't just a nice thing. He felt it was core to the human existence. What obstacles need to be removed in this part of the world still? This theme of no of zero barriers is going to be something we're going to really start to push across the foundation. Can we start to create environments where those barriers are gone and it's not the Kauffman Foundation doing it, it's that we're empowering communities to do this on their own. We're going to have a big conference next summer in June called the eShip Summit. We're going to take all these people that we've been talking to and people like them all over the country and bring them together for the first time. It's a new model of economic development that has yet to be fleshed out and we're going to learn as much as anyone else. Are there any stories you wish we could have dug a little deeper into? Oh, a bunch. Because you know that the real story, it's like two beers and an hour away, right? <laughs> I think those real stories of real people's lives don't get told. I think the Cuban woman had been there cooking tacos in Columbus Junction, the Burmese families, they would never make a movie about it because they wouldn't believe a lot of it. Anthropology should be in there studying that right. place. Right, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of answers. Right. They're not, yeah, you don't need to go to the Kalahari like, yeah. to study like American, <laughs> like the human species at work. Right. Just go to Columbus go Junction. To Columbus Junction, right? Totally. Minus Cedar Rapids, the whole New Bohemia vibe, that had a very magical feel to me. Were there moments that reaffirmed the power of entrepreneurship to change lives? Well, there's nothing more powerful than Steve Zico's daughter. One little girl can change the lives of dozens, if not hundreds of women on the other side of the world. I think what Shauna's doing, a female CEO of color, but going into a tech space, her ability to be successful in that role will create inspiration for thousands of kids, you know, that otherwise would never think it's possible. Hearing these stories makes you realize that you're not alone and that there's other inspiration around you and that, you know, you can do it too. I think it's also cool in that same vein how Dedrick talked about his father being a lieutenant to Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement in the 60s. And if you're doing that, you've got to have a kind of a pure energy that very few people have. Probably the bigger narrative is that the tools of innovation are becoming more and more democratized. And so these ecosystems in the last five years have really taken hold and that the support structures have taken hold and the culture is changing where people that are really interested in and trying to do innovative things, finally have the access to do it. Washington University is still a privileged place, but how do you start to take it to places like this? This is Ferguson. So what, what, what are the tools you need to, to democratize it to the point where people can really start to do this, even in places that might not have the privilege of going to Washington University? WashU is, a, is definitely a special place, but you know, just looking out the window at Ferguson, this looks like any town in America. It's quaint, pretty, 
to me, the greatest strength of America, it's just the norms of public discourse, the ways that people yep. interact. Americans have a very special way of working with each other. They group up to solve problems in community forums and different associations. And a startup company is just a form of civic association. And the thing about it too is it's fragile though. You look at a place like Ferguson and you see it in the political environment in the US now. But if, if the US can keep that core, the, 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 the norms of civic discourse, the ways people organize together, this country will be fine in the long run. We're heading to the airport now. I'm impressed we didn't scratch up this car. This thing's so big. Oh, thank you. All right, man. That's fun. Good job. All right. Great. See you next time. All right. Good touch. All right.